going to do the FCC rules one more time. Okay. First of all, there is no sensing requirement from FCC. So that is a line that you have to delete in your um, thing. And I will put this new P PDF on the on the website so you can download these next two or three slides, which are on FCC rules. Right now you can take a notes. But there is no sensing requirement in the United States. All you have to do is go to the database. If you cannot go to the database, go to somebody who can go to the database. So that, that is very simple. And so the fixed devices must use geolocation. It doesn't have to be GPS. By any means, you can find out your location. That's good enough, right? It could be by wireless towers, differences, so on and so forth, with the 50 meter accuracy. And must verify your location periodically. Spectrum sensing is not required. And get channel availability using daily databases. I, I think all this is same as before. And the thing is, this was the new age stuff, was that the new two channels, two channels in every area is reserved for wireless microphone. So wireless microphones can get, wireless microphones can get channels by two methods. One is they could get just like a TV station can get with FCC permanently, or they could temporarily use one of those two channels which has been reserved for them. All right, so that and rest of them are available for for peep, for for the for the devices, and then there was a lot of debate about hard versus HAGL, and what that is that outdoor antenna must be 30 meters above the ground, so this is 30 meters, not must be maximum 30 meters, sorry, maximum 30 meters above the ground, so this is called AGL above ground level, and the ground can be above the terrain, right? You can put it on a mountain, right? So you have to worry about what is the height above the average terrain, heart. All right? And so they put a limit of 250 meters on that. So you cannot just go on the top of a mountain and then put a 30 meter antenna and then you cover 45, you know, very large areas and affecting the televisions. Right? So the maximum 250 meters above average terrain and 30 meters above ground. This is, uh, this is, and the reference is right here, by the way. The reference uh, is the URL I have given here, new one. The portable devices are in two modes. Mode one that know the location, mode, mode one that don't know the location, and mode two that know the location, right? So mode two devices that know the location, they register with the database. And mode one devices must not register, need not register with the database. So they can register with, okay. So they should obtain the channel availability from mode two. So everybody has to go to the database somehow. And that's the only requirement, right? And they can only, this was another thing which I was not, but basically the 106 meter was the limit which was before on the heart. And now they left that for this part, that you must contact somebody who is at this level, who is at the height less than 106 meters. So you cannot just go to somebody who is on the top of the mountain and ask them, you know, what are the channels available to you? All right, this part. And then they should get channel verification signal from periodically. So basically, just like the channel, these more two devices, the GPS have to go to the database every day and check out whether the channel is still available. The mode one, mode one devices have to go to their mode two devices and check the availability, but it is much more frequent. It's not like one day. It is, you know, periodically they will do that, right? Third rule, which we didn't discuss before, and this is a new rule, is that you have to be away from the protected region. So if you are going to use channel two and channel two is already has this protected region, then you have to be away. How far away? You have to be four kilometers to 31 kilometers, depending upon the dis depending upon the height, right? And there is a table in the in the thing. I didn't think it was worth having the table here in the class, but there is a table here which says if you if you if you are if your height is three meters, then you have to be four kilometers away. If your height is four meters, you have to be five kilometers away. So there is a function. The higher you are, 
the farther away you have to be from the protected region. Okay. And if you are in the adjacent channel, so if you are in channel 3, then you have to be, uh, channel 3, you have to be away from this protected area, 0.4 to 2.4 kilometers. Again, there is a table. This shows you how much away, depending upon the height. So the higher the antenna, the longer separation you have to be. And obviously, you know these three contours, protected, adjacent, and co-channel. Right. So these are actually not applicable to 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 white space devices. These are applicable to channel allocation in the TV itself. So FCC will not allocate the same channel two to another station if their contours overlap. Okay, and they will not allocate channel three in this area. But you can use channel three here. That's why it is white space. It is white space because FCC will not allocate it to somebody else, another TV station. Right? It is your white space, but you have to be away from the protected region by that distance. And um, so this is, uh, I have emphasized this point. FCC does not require any spectral sensing. No need to stop transmission and sense and continuous multimedia. So previously, FCC in some version had required that you have to go every two hours and check that there is nobody else here there. Check there is nobody else there. And this was mostly because of the microphones. The wireless microphones, you know, had been using this, you know, forever. And so they were complaining that, you know, if you give it to these guys, what we'll do and all that. So everybody was checked. And because of that check, the problem was you could, you had to trans stop your data transmission and check. Right? And that would discontinue your multimedia. Suddenly your frame is freezing on your video. And so to avoid that, US FCC said, okay, we will give these two channels, even though they have not paid for it, reserved, like we saw the two channels in St. Louis, remember? There were channel numbers and we said, what is, what is this wireless microphone? Those are two reserved in St. Louis for wireless microphone. In addition, there might be other wireless microphone channels that are paid for. Okay, so there is no need to stop. Now, Europe still requires all this. Okay, so their rules are different. So when we see the standards, we will see that the standards are really, you know, in a, in a, in a problem state right now because they have to follow this as well as that. And, you know, they fight in one country and they win the war, but if they fight in the other country, don't win the war, you know, so this is going on right now. Okay. Any question about this FCC ruling? So to summarize, the difference is that there is no sensing requirement. Second thing is that the antenna height is important feature. Depending upon the antenna height, you have to be far away from the ch from the channel area. Minimum? No, there is no ten meter minimum either. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the thing is, here is what happens. Because a lot of this information is dated. You know, somebody writes a paper, there was a different rule. Then somebody writes a paper, there's a different rule. So, there is so much of confusion in the, in the, in the secondhand information. So, I went to the source and read it. And luckily, it turns out that, I mean, after 10 or 15 pages of reading, they had two pages which said, okay, final rules which was really good because then I didn't have to A and B plus C and D and everything else, right? It was everything combined, here's the rule. So that is helpful. You can read that and basically those are very clear. All right. Remember this one, these two, we, we had talked about these wireless, these are allocated here. All right, then we move on to where we were before, which was coexistence problem. So the coexistence problem is that if many different networks are going to use the same frequency, then how can they operate together? Either they will be washed out or they will cause problem with the other people. One of the two. If they are washed out, that is called exposed. Or, you know, if they cause interference to 
other people and those people don't realize it, they have to be hidden terminal. So there is a standard called 802.19.1. So 802.19's job is to do coexistence. They have been doing coexistence from day one. Basically, whenever a new standard comes up, they have to decide how this will live with the previous standards. So 2.4 gigahertz is used by 11, 15, you know, because one of the 15s is Bluetooth. So all of them use 2.4 gigahertz. So how do they work together at the same time? Thanks to 802.19, we have a procedure that allows different standards to share the same spectrum. 11, 15, 22 can all use this one common method of coexistence. Now, 19.1 is just for white spaces. Okay. And it's still, it is in, not final. I have the version, which is the latest one, February 2014. This is February 2014 right now. And um, so what they do is the methodology is very sim simple. You know, everybody reports to a manager. If there are many managers, they report to a manager, senior manager, and then senior manager decides who does what. That's how it is. So here, every white space object, every white space device has a coexistence enabler. So basically, this is one device. This, these two boxes are one device. This could be the Mac and Fi, and this is a module inside that same hardware, which we call coexistence enabler. All right. This talks to your manager, to its manager, which generally is the access point. Right. And the access points report um, to a CDIS function. And um, so basically, they, they get the information from the database, and then all the managers will um, um, will report to the CDIS function, and then they decide, okay, all right, you can use channel 3, you can use channel 5. You're all set. Suppose there is not it is not possible to use different channels. Then say, okay, all right, 50% of the time you use channel 2 and 50% of the time you use channel 2, and there is some kind of time synchronization between the two. So either there's a time division or a space division. That space division is already there. Time division or um, frequency division. Okay, different channels are different times. So the names are fancy, coexistence manager, coexistence discovery and information server, and then coexistence enabler. But the but basic idea is that this is one device and um, you report to your um, access point and access point report to this common function. Um, these are all defined in this slide. We used the picture in the previous slide. Let's see, uh, we finished everything. The, the WSO is the wave white space device. Existence enabler is um, simply the module that represents the device. And manager makes the decision for all the WSOs that it has. So this is the access point. And the discovery information server is notify CMs about potential neighbors. So basically, this is the central point. See, this is the whole central point for all the, all the CMs. Now, there are four interfaces, B, B1, B2, and B3. How does the existence enabler talk to the white space object? How does the manager talk to the enabler? How do two different managers talk to each other? And how do these, the see this talk to the point? So these are the four protocols or messages defined in that standard. All right. This protocol is not defined in that standard. This protocol is basically PAS, IETF standard, which we'll talk about later on. But these four are defined in 19.1. So interface is PAS. Each WSO registers with a CM. CM collects the data about its members and gets data from other CMs from CDIS. So basically, 
the coexistence is simply, you know, talking to your neighbors. And to talk to your neighbors, you have this kind of neighborhood committee. And the neighborhood committee manager, you know, talks to everybody and says, okay, what channel you need and what are available? Can you use this? Do you need two channels? Can you deal with one? And things like that. So then it has a set of algorithms. So first of all, coexistence discovery, find your neighbors. Find WSOs that may affect each other's performance. So here's a device that belongs to my network. There is a device next to him that belongs to some other network. Now they may interfere with each other if they both operate on channel two, right? So first you have to find out who is where. And then a statistical analysis of interference to see if the interference is expected to be more than a threshold. So now if they are five miles apart, we don't care, but if they are five meters apart, we care. So there has to be some kind of a statistical guess whether they will interfere with each other. So there are some kind of thresholds which have been set. If it is less than so many meters after some calculation, if they have been less than so many meters, then certainly you know you got to talk to them. And if a threshold. Compare distances between WSOs to threshold distance based upon technology. So you are a one watt power device and that person is a hundred milliwatt power device. How far they are, whether they will affect each other, right? So that kind of decision goes on here. And once it is, we find everybody, then we go to our senior manager and say, okay, what do we do? So senior manager actually has a list of channels. So it has gone to the database and found that we have twice of 17 channels in this zip code. Right? So it will put channels into this kind of Venn diagram. These are all the TV channels, but these are disallowed. Disallowed are the ones which are already working TV stations maybe. So these are allowed. So this is seven number 17 here. And then out of them, some may be protected and unclassified. Some we don't know really whether they, they are being used or not. And some may be protected for microphones and things like that. So these are available. Out of available, we put into restriction. Actually, sorry, microphone is not protected. Microphone is restricted. So restricted. And then out of those available, some are already being used by other people. So operating. And some of them are coexistent, means they are next to you. So anyway, so based upon this, it figures out what are the channels that are available, not operating, and, and non-coexistent. If they are if if they're available, they give it to you. If they're coexistent, then we'll do the next thing. All right. So first we do the now. So the methods for getting the channels are negotiation. Use different channel or share a channel. So basically, there is a protocol for this kind of negotiation. So there is a message which goes to the manager says, can you use channel seven and you know, or something like that, right? And then he says, okay, or no, rejected. Then can you use channel nine, accepted. You know, so these kinds of negotiation messages are there, right? So negotiation, reorganize CMs as master slaves and load balance. Otherwise we put two networks into one. Okay, if they're friendly, which they might be, if they're in the same area. And then put into one and then load balance or share. Priority allocation. All right, you, you, this is for police department and this is for not police department and therefore police department gets priority. Um, and so basically they will get the channel that they want and then you have to just wait for some other channels. Max min allocation. Max min is the idea of fairness. Now, if then you have to share anything, then there are many ways to share. So let's let me let me take, give you an example. Actually, like max min will require more than just hand waving here, which I'm doing. But um, but the idea is suppose C needs five and I need three, total eight. But let's say the total resource is seven. What is the right allocation for that when the total resource is less than our desired total? Right? 
And so there has to be a fair way of doing it. And so the fair way of doing this says that make sure whatever number you come up with, the guy who gets the minimum in this cannot be given more. The minimum minimum has to be maximized. So basically I would get, since he needs five, I need three, and we have total eight, I might get something like 2.8 or 2.9 or something, and she will get four point something, you know, I mean, so the total is seven. And so maximum will say that the minimum person gets the maximum happiness. It's not 100%, but 90%, but she is also 90% happy, right? So you cannot, so the maximum person is not 87% happy, and, the, and, the, and some other people are 89% happy. See what I mean? Everybody's happiness will be measured, but the minimum person will have the maximum happiness. That's the whole idea, okay? And this is a lot of mathematics behind it. I have written papers on this. Maximum fairness, there is something called Jan Fairness Index. I'm not going to go to that right now, okay? But um, this is like, this actually standard says Jan, use Jan Fairness Index. So, I mean, you know, so, so it is, it is, it is an area that is very, very common, okay? Power control. And then they might say, okay, all right, you use uh, not 100 milliwatt, but use 550 milliwatt, and you use 50 milliwatt, maybe you don't have interference. So, you understand that the way they organize this whole thing is there are many options, and, um, and generally they assume that people are cooperating. All right? And this is a standard, by the way. In the standard, they put everything that is possible. What will happen is there would be a trade body, just like Wi-Fi association. There would be a, well, this might go into Wi-Fi, I don't know, but this might not go into Wi-Fi. 82.11 AF, for example, probably would go to Wi-Fi, and they might put a set of, okay, no, no, everybody should be able to do one of these options. You know, everybody must do that in addition to anything else they want to do. So that way we can talk to each other, right? Otherwise somebody puts maximum allocation and somebody else puts something else, right? So with these protocols in place, with these protocols in place, now we can coexist, right? Now the messages. Um, so the message starts from here. The MAC object says, I want to join the network. So it sends a media subscription request. Media is nothing but the media access control. Okay. So it says, can I do, can I use this air? It tells an enabler. Okay. So the message will go from left to the right. At that point, the second message would be the enabler will ask the manager, oh, I need a channel to use. The manager will tell you the channel, and then it will go back. This response will be like right here. The response would go right there. Okay, in the other direction, to say, okay, you can use channel two or channel three, whatever. Right? And they say, okay, I'm happy. So this arrow will go other way. So, um, so this is an example of a set of messages that go between those three. Right? So let's just do one more time. Sorry, this is right, right, left, and then left. All right, similarly, the, the CM will talk to see this in a similar way. They will go to them and say, can I use, you know, I want to use some channel, please let me know what is the list. And it will, you know, some other people will come and say the same thing, and then they will decide. So there is a similar set of protocols, like we said, you know, talk to, for CMs to talk to see this. All right, that's all I want to say about 19.1 coexistence. Any question about this? So you might be wondering as to how come Bluetooth, which is 2.4 gigahertz, and Wi-Fi work on your cell phone all the time, right? Thanks to eight, the same channels, 802.19, they work this out. And um, the way this works in here is time division. So whenever Bluetooth is working for those microseconds, not for seconds, for those microseconds, Wi-Fi is not working. And then when the Wi-Fi is working, Bluetooth is not working. 
So you don't notice the difference, but there are time division. At least in one device. Now it is quite possible that her Bluetooth might interfere with my Wi-Fi. Right? Because there is no common manager. But access point will have, you know, so that, that doesn't happen here because the access points don't talk to Bluetooth. Bluetooth don't have access point. So, but from one device, we don't have interference with itself. Yes, yes. In fact, um, that's why 2.4 gigahertz is being given up by Wi-Fi is because the data ref has gone dropped down significantly. You buy a device, you bring home, and then say it doesn't work, and you call the manufacturer, and it doesn't work. It gives me five megabits, and you said 54 megabits, but they don't know that your house is bad. You know, that's the problem. All right. So the next thing is dice pen. DICE pen stands for Dynamic Spectrum Access Networks Committee. Dynamic Spectrum Access Networks. DICE pen. D Y S P A N. Okay. And um, it started out its life as SCC41. Now I think the number has been dropped. And um, the word coordinating has been dropped. So it is now standards committee, SC. And it is under IEEE. And uh, so it has a number 1900. All right. Now, this is dynamic spectrum access. So this looks like something where you change the spectrum all the time. This is white space. Right. So how come it started before, right? And in this one, there are two st standards which are of interest and we'll talk about. One is 4A. 4 is, okay, so 1900.4 is to optimize the resource usage, to, to optimize the resource, which in this case is spectrum. And 4A is especially for wide spaces. And then there is 7, which just started at two years ago, so there's not much, so we won't talk about it is the radio interface for fi for fixed and mobile operation. So I couldn't find too much information on that one and switched us too early. 4A is what we will talk about. Okay, now let's see what is this problem that solving. The problem here is similar to, similar to, um, coexistence, but it's not really coexistence problem. The problem is, each device has many, many interfaces. So your device has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and 3G, 4G, 2G. Okay, so 3, 2G, 3G, 4G, and it also has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Five, five interfaces. Thank God it doesn't have Ethernet. But anyway, so some devices may have six, okay, Ethernet as well. And some place you go out of those six, three are available. All right, so which one should you use? Well, this one costs two dollars a minute. This one costs, you know, zero cents a minute. This one costs this one cents a minute. So you have to decide manually what to use. Can we automate it so that it is all, you know, automatically when you do something, it it selects the right technology, right? So that's the problem it is solving. So here we have these networks available, and these devices have access, I mean, basically to some of these, right? So which network should be used and which band should be used? So for example, you have 802.11n, it is dual band. So should it use 2.4 or 5.8 in that location? And um, so, so that is basically the question. So how to select a network and in a network, how to select the band? So I think we already said this thing, dynamic spectrum assignment, select the band, dynamic spectrum sharing, share a band. So here is quite possible that um, assignment is good, that basically you got a channel. So th somebody has to do two things actually. First, normally you have to do the devices have to select the network available. 
but also the networks have to decide what band to use because if they use the same band, they can start interfering with each other, right? So the devices could get an exclusive control of a channel, which is assignment, or they may have to share a channel. So this is very similar to 19.1, where WiMAX and LTE both have to share a channel. Okay, it could be Wi-Fi as well. I'm just giving an example here, right? They could be just given the same band and then they have to share. Third thing they may have to do is distributed resources optimization. So the thing is, we want to optimize the global objectives. The global objective is that maximum number of people can transfer maximum number of bits while meeting the individual requirements. Somebody wants to watch a video, somebody wants to transfer a file, somebody wants to just play a game. So somehow, you know, we have to do so that, you know, everybody is happy. Same, you know, it's like fairness problem. Everybody is happy to some extent, but the total is maximum. All right. So this is the problem that 1900.4 does. Three things. It does assignment, sharing, and optimization. So how do we solve it? Just like before, we have a manager, we'll talk to the manager, and so on and so forth. The names are slightly different. And um, so each network has a spectrum manager, a radio access network. Now here's the thing. There are two names which are used for the networks in wireless area. One is called RAN. RAN is radio access network. And one is RAT. R-A-T, radio access technology. They mean one and the same thing. Okay. In this standard, we talk about RAN. I have seen that whenever we study 3G or ITU document, they use RAT for whatever reason. So, so here it is a radio access network. So each radio access network, which is shown here, Sorry, actually there are several radio access networks shown here. There is one radio access network 1 and radio access network N. Each radio access network has a measurement collector. So it measures what is available or how much is required, whatever. So it, it does the measurement. And then there is a configuration manager, reconfiguration manager. Since this is all dynamic access, means you can change yourself. This is for cognitive radios. So there is some, some module which changes it when necessary. Okay. And, the, and then there is a controller which basically tells where to go. All right. So let's see here. So we have a radio access network. It has a measurement unit and it has a reconfiguration unit. They report to this overall thing, which is the spectrum manager and um, the reconfiguration manager. This another RAN will also have RM and RRC and, the, and, and they will report to the same common ORM and, and OSM and NRM. So basically what it is, this is the master boss. These are the individual bosses for each network. Okay. On the terminal side, which is the user side, Similarly, there are three, a measurement controller, a reconfiguration manager, and a reconfiguration controller. Okay. And um, the lines here, solid lines here, or thick lines here, they indicate the protocols that this standard standardizes or specifies. So there is a protocol for TRM to NRM. There is a protocol from RMC to NRM. There is a protocol from RRC to NRM. Um, and you see there are two lines between this TRM and this NRM because they are two different networks. So this TRM goes through this network, talks to NRM, this goes to that. And then there is a protocol for OSM to NRM. So to, some, to, to, to basically, I mean, 
this, probably there's too much detail here, but all there is, is that there is somebody who looks after the whole spectrum, who has the idea of the spectrum availability, and then it doles out to individual network managers, and the individual network managers then basically reconfigure their system. It also has a facility where the individual individual networks could report back saying that I think this is available here in my area. You know, channel 4 is good, you know, or channel 5.8 is good, or channel 2.4 is good. So, so there is this feedback to the super manager, and then you get the yeah, channel that you need. Okay. And um, for white space, now they have some more names. And um, again, I want you to get the key idea out. And so basically the idea is that for white spaces, there is white space manager. Um, then there is a measurement collector, white space cognitive based station measurement collector. So instead of calling network measurement collector NMC, they call it CBS NMC, CBSMC. CBS is cognitive base station measurement collector. Okay. So this senses the spectrum. There is a reconfiguration controller. So this one basically configures the cognitive base station. And there is a reconfiguration manager which um, manages the, this is the reconfiguration manager which manages the base station. So now what happens is all of this is one base station, this, not all of it, this one. Inside that base station, there is a module which takes part into this activity and is called resource manager, right? Reconfiguration manager, sorry, reconfiguration manager. Similarly, this network consists of two base stations, base station one and base station two. Each of them have their own reconfiguration managers and they report to a common network-wide manager. All right. So, and now these are the bands which are available. White space one, white space two, white space three. So the terminals have their own manager, TRMW, and they somehow talk to the base station and then get associated to the particular band that the base station can speak and the terminals can speak. In some cases, the networks have to share the same band. In some cases, terminals have to share the same band. Okay, so there is a sharing assignment and optimization is actually on parallel with all this. So, so what do you need to remember? Basically, you need to remember that there is something which has standards designed for selecting the bands, selecting the network. And, um, Hopefully, when it is implemented, right now it is not implemented. So, it, right now it is very simple. If Wi-Fi is available, you can't use 4G, period. That's it, right? And if Wi-Fi is not there, then use 4G. But that doesn't really tell when you can use Bluetooth. And if I want to transfer a file between two things, I have to manually select Bluetooth. Okay? So, with this, hopefully, not only with four, actually different technology will be able to do it automatically with 4A, even white space will be covered. All right, so let me just summarize one more time. Die span is dynamic spectrum access and it solves the problem of having multiple networks and each device is having multiple interfaces. This is different than 19. 19 was not concerned about this one, it was concerned about multiple networks sharing the same spectrum. Right? This is more concerned about finding the right network and the right spectrum. Two things. You need to find the right network, you have multiple interfaces, find the right interface, right network and for the networks to also share the spectrum. So, they are coming from two different angles, two different committees, two different standards. 
there's very fine difference. Does everybody understand the difference of 1900 and 19? Right, 1900 is about multi, about the recent devices with many many interfaces. All right, if you understand that, then we move on to pause. So, what we need is. Every technology has a way as to how to talk to the database. Well, every tech, and let me put it this other way. No, let me say it correctly again. Second, every technology needs to talk to the database, and they could decide. For example, eleven AF could decide how I even want to talk to the Google database, and twenty-two could decide how I want to talk to Google database. And there could be other technologies they could decide. But the problem with that would be that Google will be implementing many, many different protocols. How to talk to 11 AF, how to talk to 22. So somebody decided, hopefully it was Google, or somebody decided that we should have one protocol to talk to the database regardless of the technology. All right? And so IETF got into the act and is designing a protocol called PAS that allows any technology to talk to this government database. And the government database has several rules that the government has put that every database access should follow. For example, security issues. Nobody should know that I am using channel two. I mean, nobody should know that whatever, I mean, basically, there are some privacy and secrecy issues, right? But at the same time, if necessary, we should figure out who is using channel two, because if nobody knows, then somebody could just keep it forever, for life, right, without paying for it. And nobody will be able to use it. So there is a secrecy, but then there is a public rights and so on and so forth. So the whole discussion in that FCC document also about privacy and security. All the rules have to be followed. So this protocol is being designed to allow that kind of security. And it is totally independent of the lower layer, which in this case is 11 or 22 or 15 or whatever that is. IP is at higher layer, right? So these are the messages which you can use any of the wired or wireless technologies to get to the databases. So it is spectrum agnostic. And um, the main, so the, we first start with a terminology, master device and a slave device. Master device is the one that goes directly to the database, and a slave device is the one that goes to the master device. All right, slave devices do not talk to the database directly. So now, if, if, if you are paying attention, when we were talking about FCC rules, there were two modes, mode one and mode two. Which mode is master, which mode can has to be slave? Right, mode one is a slave device because it just doesn't it it doesn't have GPS or anything like that. So it has to ask somebody else, you know, what is what channel I can use. Mode two could be slave two. It doesn't have to go to the database. It could go to another manager and ask them. But whoever goes, so here I have shown all possibilities. So this access point could be a slave, in which case it could get it from this um, cache unit, or it could go directly. So this could be a master or a slave. This is clearly a master and so on. So once we have decided this, then now we just have to talk about what happens between the master and the database. That's all. We don't have to worry about the slave part. The slave part is protocol specific. So the station should be able to discover the white space database. It's a regulatory domain, which country it is in and maybe pre-configured DNS or certification authorities. So the first thing is that we have to know where the, who has the, where the database is, right, before you can access it. So you have to know, if nothing else, you have to know it is called www.google.database.com or www.database.google.com, something like that. So you have to know that 
that URL to go there. So how do you know that? Well, maybe the manufacturer will put it or maybe you can download it from some place then you first install whatever that is. You know, it's very similar to the certificates. Your computer has hundreds of certificates built in. Where did they come from? Microsoft put it when they gave it to the computer. And every time when you update, they update that list. Okay? I don't know how many of you have seen certificates in your computer, but in the next class, a computer networking course that I will teach next semester, will show you how to, you know, basically find good certificates, bad certificates in your computer. So, so there are certificates which are built in and, and updated, right? <clears throat> so similarly, you will have this database list which will be built into the device. So the listing server will list all national database servers, or you could have just one listing server which will be just, you know, globally unique, and you just, everybody goes to that place and it says, okay, all right, you are from US, okay, here is your list of 10. You are from Germany, here is a list of two. So for, so that could be done that way too. The only problem is that that centralized thing would be kind of, again, a problem. You know, somebody could, you know, hack it and then the whole world will be out of white space. So master may register with the database. And so when you go, first thing you do is with pause is you register. You can say, well, I am this device. This is my serial number. I am owned by Wustel and I am located in St. Louis and, and my latitude, longitude is such and such. I have an antenna which has so much power and that antenna is pointing north and therefore my antenna gain in north direction is 3 dB, in south it is 0 dB and so on and so forth. Right? So basically all of that is registered with the, you tell the database everything that you need to tell. And there is mutual authentication. So the database tells you their certificate, you give your certificate to them and they match. I mean, they, they are cert not match. They basically are verified that you have valid certificate and that they have valid certificate, then you go ahead. Master can query the database, that's okay. Database would be able to push updates on the channel availability changes. So this is another feature that PAS has put, is that you can go and register and then you can ask and we'll give it to you, but it can also come unasked for. So it could come in the middle of the day and say, oh, channel three has gone, you know, please get out of that. Okay, push. So there's a push feature here. Ensure security of discovery mechanism, access methods, and query response. And everything is encrypted. So nobody else can read what you're talking about. So nobody else needs to know what is your power and how much I mean, of course, if they are neighbors, they will go to the database and say, I am located also in St. Louis and, and I am also pointing to the north and, and then they will get a different set of channels or whatever, right? So, but everything is encrypted. All right, there is an RFC. There is an RFC which is listed here and which describes basically requirements only right now. So the, work, the group is still working and the RFC has just come out in May 2013 and it's readable. See, one good thing about RFCs versus standards is the standards are very difficult to read, RFCs are very easy to read. And if nothing else, you should just go and read that RFC to see because in your life you'll be reading lots of RFCs. If you are ever in the networking business, reading RFCs is a daily affair. All right, so PAS allows WSD, white space device, to specify geolocation, height, serial number, certificate, device class, radio access technology, RAT, antenna gain, maximum EIRP, radiation pattern, spectrum mass, owner contact, phone number, everything is you have to be given, actually even the phone number, okay? Allows database to specify the available spectrum, available area, allowed power levels. So here is the thing in that 106 meter height and the 250 meter height. If you say that I am located at 250 meters, then it will not let you give the channels to other people who are 
asking you, right? So those kinds of rules are basically implemented by this, where you tell the height, and depending upon the height, there are certain things you are allowed to do, certain power levels you are allowed to have. All right, then allows WSD, the white space device, to register its selected spectrum for use. So once you have given a channel list, and then you say, well, I selected five, then you register with them so they know that you're using five for the next two days. Allows privacy to WSD, which is encryption. And here are some sample messages, okay? And if you, if you go to the document, which actually is here, no, not here, um, maybe it in reference list we'll see. So there is another document. In addition to that RFC, there is a draft. So the way RFCs work is, the way IFT, IETF works is that somebody writes a draft and then they modify it, modify it, modify it for a year or two and finally they publish it as RFC, as agreed. So RFC requirements have been agreed and that is an RFC, but the protocol itself has not been agreed. It's a draft. Okay, so the draft is, uh, I have a reference to the draft at some point, but anyway, the draft specifies these things and these can change. Okay, so the master device says initializations, I want to connect to you, initialization response. Okay, and then registration, so it tells my height is so and such and that I need a spectrum, right? So available spectrum, so then it sends up available spectrum query. So the thing is, you can register, but you don't have to ask for a spectrum. You can just register. And then, you know, so then you send a query for available spectrum and you get a response. And you can send not one query, but you can send a batch query. What is a batch query? So you could say, well, I have 15 stations, one located in St. Louis, one located in, you know, Frontenac, one located in Queen, whatever, University City. You, you, you are spread all over, right? So you have to tell all the areas. So you can give a whole set of locations and antennas and things like that. And then you get set of locations and channels that might be applicable to your set. Right? So you get a batch response. Use notify. You tell them that I want to use this channel and use response registered fine and device validation request and device validation response. Uh, this will come from the database and the database will send a request to the master device saying that please verify that station number three is um, there, you know, in the location that you told me. And so then the master device will go to that location, figure out yeah, it's there, and then it will say, yeah, respond. Okay, yeah, it's there or it's not there. Yeah. Yeah, so the thing is, the question, I think the question is, does FCC monitor how much power you are using? So it's like um, everything else the police does. They just, you know, don't really bother you if somebody doesn't complain. <laughs> if somebody complains, then they will come blaring at your home and then say, what are you doing, man? <laughs> and you're violating the law, and then there might be a court case and, you know, things like that. So, yes, I mean, they don't, so they don't have their station sitting everywhere and monitoring this, but if somebody complains, then they will. Okay, let's see more. Actually, this is basically, I think um, this slide is same thing as this picture, but I just want to double check that everything we have covered. So listing request to and from listing server not shown. So basically we have not shown one server here. Before you find the database, you go to the listing server, which is global or something, and you say, well, which are the databases? And then you select one database and you start talking to it, right? The listing server. So that, there is a message for that as well. Then initialization, exchange the capability, location, and get the rules. So this is where you give the location, right? And you get the rules. And the registration, you give the model number, serial number, antenna characteristics. Available spectrum is that request basically tells you what you can use. And device validation, the database may ask masters to authenticate slaves. All right? So that's why the arrows would be in the 
other direction that comes from the database to check that um, that station is really what it is. All right, this brings us to the end of this uh, whole module. Before that comes to actually, there's one thing I have put here, which is not really, I mean, part of the protocols, but there is something that you should be aware of called GANU radio. It is an open source software defined radio kit, SDR. So you can, if you want to ever design an SDR, you can use this software. And um, just like Linux, many companies use this software as well. Open source operating system is Linux, open source radio is this radio. It uses Python and C++. C++ for something that is very high performance oriented. High speed operations, um, sorry, C++ for high uh, performance critical signal processing in C++ and then everything else is in Python. Python is much higher level and therefore per performance is not an issue. If performance is not an issue, then it is done in Python. And there is a hardware that you can buy called USRP, Universal Software Radio Peripheral. This is a general purpose computer for SDRs. So just like Arduino and other microcontrollers people buy. Now this is not at the same price level. This is, you know, I check it is few hundred dollars. But for few hundred dollars, you can buy this board and then, you know, use the, use the radio and you have your software defined radio. Now this board has a CPU and it has several FPGAs and things like that. Okay. So these are both open source in some sense. I mean, the software is clearly open source. The hardware, um, I think there is some sort of um, thing, so it is not very confidential. So you can modify it and things like that. So anyway, so this is a combination that you should know about. <clears throat> Summary. So this was the lecture on white spaces. We give it, we did it in three modules, but just to rem remember this first thing is that because we went from analog to digital TV, we went from analog to digital TV, we got back a lot of a spectrum for several reasons. First of all, the digital TV takes less. Second, digital TV is not that fussy about the next channel, about the next area. So you can put them closer together. So a lot of space that was not used before is now become available in 700 megahertz band, which is called white space, TV white space. And FCC has allowed license exam use of some of the white space in the TV bands, and this requires a cognitive radio. And what is a cognitive radio? A cognitive radio is an SDR, software-defined radio, that can reconfigure itself, right? So if you put that closed loop, that becomes a cognitive radio. Then the, the main standard that we discussed in this module is 11AF, which uses 5 megahertz, 10 megahertz and 20 megahertz channel out of the 6 megahertz. Basically, it uses 5 point some megahertz. So anyway, and it uses, um, you can use four channels, you can bond up to four channels and get up to 400 megabits per second using OFDM, multi-user MIMO, and 256 QAM. Um, 19.1, today we discussed that one, so we should remember it's coexistence issue. It allows, um, several networks in the same area. 1900 is the resource usage issue. It tries to optimize so that the devices find the right network for whatever they're doing. And then the PAS is the protocol to access the databases. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so basically, here's the thing. I mean, let me just explain to you. If you remember, there was this very deep, um, very steep um, decline in the spectrum mask. You remember the spectrum mask, 55 dB? So if you use whole 6 megahertz, you are going to overflow. So they use 5 point some number. So the whole decline is inside that 6 megahertz. All right, uh, so let's see, going back to reading list. 
reading list is a little bit bigger than um, than i would like but um, um you start from the top okay july 2013 and then um, move down so for uh, pause i was telling you that there are two of them there is a draft so here is the draft draft ietf pause draft very easy to read and the rfc is very easy to read and so on um reading list continues then we have wikipedia links and the references there are plenty of references which as i said you don't have to read but if you wanted to find out fcc that they are where is the fcc standards uk standards i have put all of them here in the references um okay all right that's it